Good morning and welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder and this is BRN AM for Thursday, May 28th, 2020. And here are our top stories. Are the rules changing for the Paycheck Protection Program? And the OMB gets the RFI for the MEPS and PEPS. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Kevin Walsh. He is a principal with the Groom Law Group, an employee benefits law firm based in Washington, D.C. Kevin, welcome back to the program. I'm doing well. I think like most law firms right now, we're, we're based at everybody's house, but saying based in Washington, D.C. Is, is where we are in normal times. Yep, and I see that you have shaved the quarantine beard, looking very lovely as always. I know. I, uh, a part of me misses the quarantine beard, but uh, my wife likes the clean shaved look a little bit more. Yeah, well, it looks, it, it, it certainly fits you either way. So let's jump right in. Um, as, the, as of the time we're recording this, a lot is changing with the Paycheck Protection Program, which was a central part of the CARES Act. And I want to check in with you and the folks at Groom Law into your analysis around this ever-changing statute. Yeah, so the Paycheck Protection Program was created by the CARES Act, um, and about $349 billion was allocated to it. Um, that money went out the door very quickly. Um, <laughs> And then, you know, once the money got out the door, uh, Treasury, the SBA, Congress, and others in the executive branch started thinking, well, that's a whole lot of money to get out the door in a hurry. Maybe we were too liberal in letting people get money. Maybe the rules should have been a little stricter. So what happened is that kind of after the fact, Treasury released guidance um, saying, you know, if you're a uh, subsidiary of a large publicly traded company, or if you're a subsidiary of a um, privately held company and you have access to capital, uh, maybe you don't have sufficient economic uncertainty uh, to be eligible to pursue it in the program. Yeah. And that yeah. guidance kind of, it, it scared the heck out of everybody because, I mean, you think we're in a pandemic um, and there's this program that's designed to provide help for us. Uh, and now Treasury is saying, you know, maybe, maybe even with the pandemic, you don't have enough economic uncertainty. Yeah. And yeah. So what happened then is Congress then passed a second tranche of money, another, I think it's about $300 billion more, um, which is designed to provide kind of employers with less than 500 employees um, forgivable loans where if you meet the eligibility criteria, and they're very streamlined eligibility criteria, uh, and you spend the money um, on payroll um, and rent incurred before the pandemic, mortgage interest incurred before the pandemic or utilities that are kind of ongoing during the pandemic, um, then you don't have to pay that money back. You know, you can apply and have that, that money forgiven. So, you know, there's just a bit of a whipsaw with the guidance. And where we are now is that second tranche of 300 billion, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it hasn't gone out the door. So 350 went out in a hurry, they topped it up. But now this new 300 billion has been going out the door much slower because companies are wondering, well, you know, it looks like there might be a whole lot more kind of conditions than than were in place. Um, so it looks like Treasury is beginning to swing back in the other direction again. Um, just recently, they said if, if you're a, a very small employer or you're a small employer uh, and you borrow less than $2 million um, and you apply for forgiveness for that less than $2 million, uh, that you will not automatically be audited. Um, that in terms of making the economic uncertainty representation, you will be deemed to have had sufficient economic uncertainty. Um, so, I mean, there's this program and it's it, it's doing a great job at, at getting money in the hands of kind of small businesses to help them make payroll. But there's a bit of a political, hmm, what's a word I, I can use on the air here? Hot, pot hot potato, difference of opinion. Yeah, there's a bit of a, of a something that, that, that you know, they, they, they've swung wildly um, yeah. and it's created uncertainty for the folks that are trying to help. And yeah. I, I think the hope is that they can clarify that in the next kind of week or two. And, but I want to take a step back here, Kevin, because it's not uncommon, I would think. And, and the reaction um, to creating this program, I mean, th this was done very rapidly. We had to shut things down. And it's not uncommon, right, to change 
rules over time. We just have done it in a very compressed time frame to make sure that the people who really need it, I mean, the businesses who really need it, are getting it. And I think, I just want to get your sense for this, that changing rules and regs over time to adapt to a changing marketplace probably is not that uncommon. So I, I, I think there's a difference here between, you know, changing regs over time where, I mean, we're going to talk one of these weeks about, you know, the changing from paper disclosure to electronic disclosure over the passage of time. I mean, here we had legislation that was passed during a crisis uh, that passed kind of unanimously. Uh, and, you know, Congress made a decision that they want the money to get out the door fast. Mm -hmm. You know, they created a program with very few um, restrictions. Yep. So, I mean, here, where the money has now gone out the door, uh, to then come up with restrictions that slow the, the rate that that money gets out the door, I mean, it, it's really designed to help businesses through June 30th. So, I mean, any uncertainty in terms of the rulemaking process here um, or changes after people have borrowed, I mean, it, it, while changing regulations seems reasonable, if you borrowed money, if you took out a mortgage and your bank then said a few weeks later, well, we've changed the terms of the loan. Right. I mean, that's not really just changing to update with the times. It's kind of they, they, they sold you a bill of goods and, and now they're not delivering on that. Yeah. So it's certainly going to present some challenges to people who have already borrowed and people looking to take money. And I would certainly think that this will also change the way banks and other lending institutions now are scrutinizing, if that's even the right word, uh, these applications. Because I think you mentioned the flow of applications has definitely slowed down because the pendulum has swung the other way. This could be could cause harm in some ways to these smaller businesses net looking to access the capital that do not have access to public markets or other ways to access capital traditionally. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for the for the financial institutions themselves, the rules haven't changed. Um, you know, they're still guaranteed to get paid the money back, whether or not the small businesses default. Mm -hmm. um, for the small businesses, I mean, Congress made a decision in the legislation to say that, you know, even companies that have access to financing elsewhere can participate in this SBA lending program. Uh, and that's unusual compared to other SBA lending programs. But I, I think... Um, I think now there's there's just more uncertainty for those small businesses that participate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Kevin, appreciate that analysis. It's an ever-changing world. When we come back, though, we're going to talk to Kevin about MEPS and PEPS. Those are multiple employer plans and pooled employer plans. A lot going on in that space as well. So you're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN AM. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses. I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. The windows on our homes, they protect us in the ones we love, but they do much more. At Renewal by Anderson, making your home more comfortable is at the center of every window we make. 
It's why we custom build our windows in America and install them in as little as one day. It's why we build our frames with exclusive Fibrex composite material that's two times stronger than vinyl. It's why our glass helps keep your home warmer in winter, cooler in summer, and quieter all year long. It's why we stand behind every window with a 20-year limited warranty. Why not help lower your energy costs while giving your home and family the best? Call 1-800-835-6525 to schedule a free in-home consultation. Buy one, get one at 40% off with this special offer. Plus, get special financing with no money down, no monthly payments, and no interest for one full year. Renewal by Anderson, the better way to a better window. Call 1-800-835-6525 now. Welcome back. We're talking to Kevin Walsh, principal with Groom Law Group. Kevin, thanks so much for sticking around with us this morning. It's always good being on your show, Jeff. Yeah, it's great to, great to uh, connect with you. So let's let's jump right in. We, we talked about PPP and the ever-changing world there. Pooled employer plans, multiple employer plans. These could potentially provide access for small businesses to retirement plan uh, structures. There's some new developments there. What, what can you tell us, Kevin? Well, Jeff, I thought it was great today that we would talk about just three-letter acronyms that begin and end in P. <laughs> so we did PPP, and now we're doing PEP. Uh, I mean, what, what can we do next? Uh, but uh, pooled employer plans, or PEPs, are, are going to be one of the big retirement developments in the next kind of year and a yeah. half. Um, we talked a whole bunch about the SECURE Act and about RESA before that, which were two big pieces of retirement legislation. Uh, and one of the things that the SECURE Act did is it created a new type of retirement plan. Um, it creates a plan where, you know, a financial institution or another entity can be the pooled plan provider. So they can sponsor the plan instead of, you know, uh, Joe's gas station or, or Jeff Snyder's retirement network. Um, you know, instead of having your own plan, you can go to this, this entity, this pooled plan provider, and ask them, say, we hear that you're running a plan for lots of employers. Uh, we would like to participate in your plan. These are our employees. We'll deposit the money. But then from there, we'd like you to run with as much of it as you're allowed to. Um, the idea being that, you know, if I have a small business, I might not want to run my own retirement plan. There's a lot of administration that, you know, I'm, I might be making widgets and I'd rather spend my time on widgets than on, on, on 401ks. Yep. Um, and in order to do this, so this, this bill created this new, the Secure Act created these programs. In order to do this, we need a whole bunch of regulations. So uh, these pooled plan providers, they've already begun talking to the Labor Department. And they're saying, well, I mean, there's key things. Like if I'm going to be a pooled plan provider, um, the statute says I've got to register with DOL. So I've got to submit some form of paperwork to let them know that I want to do this. If these plans are supposed to launch at the beginning of next year, if I want to be a pool plan provider, I kind of need that now. Like, I need to register, so you got to let me know that. And then you've got to let me know what I've got to do as a pool plan provider in terms of plan administration um, and then the different services that I'm, I'm required to provide. And where we are right now is DOL is working on rules, and they're at the early stage. So uh, either by the time this is aired uh, or shortly thereafter, we're going to see a request for information mm -hmm. where DOL is going to formally come out with kind of a handful of ideas and kind of a whole bunch of questions for uh, kind of plan sponsors, for employers that don't offer plans, for companies that might want to be pooled plan providers, and then companies that might want to provide services to those plans uh, saying, you know, here are the issues that we think we need to provide guidance on. How do you think we should provide guidance? What should we do in a proposed rule? What should we do in a final rule? Um, so this is really a key step in terms of getting these things up and running at the beginning of next year. And and so this goes out. I just want to kind of update the audience on the process. So this is this is traditionally how it is done in terms of rulemaking. Uh, this is that first step, and then this information is then gathered. I would I would assume the RFI goes out. It's get information comes back, and then what's the what's the timeline look for the uh, you know, to let all this data kind of marinate and to then make rulemaking decisions or the next step along the way. So given the tight deadline here where they want to have these things up and running by uh, the beginning of next year, uh, if they actually want to do that, and, and they, I mean, regulators miss deadlines, things don't always happen um, on time. But if they wanted to do that, you'd think, well, we get this RFI out in mid-May, end of May, we give people maybe 30 days to respond, mm -hmm end of June, uh, maybe 60 days to respond, end of July. Um, 
you think the agency, if they're really rushing, really racing, would take maybe a month or two to review those rules, to review the comments? Yep. Um, and then they could put out a proposed rule or maybe an interim final rule. They could put out some form of guidance that you know entities that are, are in the business could could begin to rely on. Uh, they could also do this along a couple tracks. You know, they might have some. They might have proposed rules that they they want to issue. Um, and for some of these, like how do you register? They might be able to start that process while they're still gathering information about other aspects of of what a PEP's going to look like. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it would make a lot of sense. I mean, it can be like done incrementally. And I'm just thinking about. You know, I, I have been on the record keeping and operation side, and I know that when you have new tax laws and new changes, there are always operational elements, whether it's updating systems and whatnot. And that takes time to plan for as well, Kevin. And I know that many of your clientele are some of these asset management and record keeping firms that would, or associations that may be an interest in, have an interest in sponsoring these. I would assume that there's a ramp on period to do that as well on top of marketing and reaching out to potential clients and prospects? Uh, there is, and I, I think one of the helpful things is that the statute itself has a good faith uh, compliance provision mm -hmm. where if before rules come out, uh, you develop these PEPs and you kind of develop your own internal rules that generally comply with the statute and are kind of a good faith effort to comply, um, you have a safe harbor. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with that is that that really only exists until uh, DOL comes out with rules that are applicable. So you might be able to get a product up and running, but were DOL to go in a dramatically different direction, uh, you might end up having to replicate a lot of your startup costs. So I, I think, I mean, the companies I'm working with are, they're making progress. They want to have these things up and running. Yep. They want to get more uh, employees into retirement plans than are today. They want to close the coverage gap. Um, but they'd also really like guidance because they don't want to incur a lot of cost in terms of helping people get access to retirement plans only to have to kind of duplicate those costs and incur them again. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. You're running a business, you want to be profitable and you don't want to duplicate your, your expenses in, in starting up. And you mentioned the savings gap. I mean, the savings gap in this country is, is humongous. There are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 million people who do not have access to a retirement plan. So this is really, in that work for a small employer, this is really a critical component and was a critical component to the SECURE Act that you mentioned, the aforementioned the SECURE Act and something we've talked about in the network before. Um, this is really important, right? I mean, this is something where, I know you talked about good faith, but between Department of Labor, these organizations that are interested in sponsoring and employers that are interested in adopting, this is critical to retirement security in the United States. Yeah, this is critical. I mean, the, the most recent stat that I saw said that more than half of employees at small employers don't have access to a retirement savings plan. And if these PEPs can get up and running, and if small employers know that there's a way to provide benefits effectively and without incurring a bunch of administrative burden or a significant increase in costs, I mean, this seems like a way that Congress thinks we can we can kind of bring that number down so that we can have more employees in a better position to save for retirement. Yeah, and you know what? With all this pandemic that's going on and the, the negative impact we've had unemployment and people really hit hard financially, this is really the opportunity, in my opinion, to build an even stronger retirement system, which would include these types of plans. Kevin, always a pleasure chatting with you. Thanks so much for taking time. Thanks so much for uh, giving us your insight and we look forward to having you back on the program so very soon. Uh, thanks, Jeff. It's always fun to appear. Talk to you soon. And that wraps up this episode of BRN AM. Have a topic of interest or someone you think we should talk to? Drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the news in retirement, markets, technology, personal finance, and more, check out today's edition of The Morning Pulse. So until tomorrow, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Attention, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. 
I called the Medicare coverage helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-757-1451. That's 1-800-757-1451.